the Archduchy of Austria, a country ruled by the famous dynasty with a quite distinctive jawline. Monarchs from this dynasty held the title of Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and a few other titles. Nevertheless, they didn't rule the empire directly. They still had to take into account the opinions of the electors. Their great dream was to centralize power and take full control of the Holy Roman Empire. In reality, they did not achieve this. But in today's episode, I'll play an alternative history in which I'll strive for this goal. Greetings imperialists, it's Lucas here. Currently, Friedrich III von Habsburg sits on the Austrian throne, who, let's be honest, is quite an average ruler, though he's diplomatically talented. His heir is Ladislaus the Posthumous. If he manages to reach adulthood, that is 15 years old. He should inherit Hungary. But will this happen? Well, that depends on the decisions of the Hungarians. If not, there are other ways to assume power in this declining country. However, the matter of Hungary is secondary. The most important thing is to maintain the position of the emperor and to seize complete power in the Holy Roman Empire. Achieving this through military means would be rather difficult. Therefore, Friedrich will strive to reform this empire and centralize power in one hand. Unfortunately, taking control won't be without challenges. The duchies will oppose all these reforms. That's why it will be necessary to gain significant authority among them. Imperial authority. The fastest way to achieve this was to reclaim lands that previously belonged to the empire. But due to unfortunate events, they ended up under the rule of, for instance, Duke Philip III of Burgundy or Provence. To address this issue, our emperor knew that it was essential to secure our eastern flank. For this purpose, he formed an alliance with the Kingdom of Poland. He also insulted the Duchy of Burgundy on the international stage. This made it easier to form alliances with their enemies. With Provence, he proceeded directly since the matter was much simpler. An alliance was struck with the Papacy, the Duchy of the Palatinate and Savoy. Friedrich also declared Burgundy a rival on the international stage. He did the same with Bohemia and the Ottoman Empire. He then addressed the issue issue of estates privileges in Austria. The clergy, in exchange for certain privileges, supported us in diplomatic pursuits, in reforming the country, and formalized relations with the clergy, allowing us to employ cheaper advisors. The nobility backed our archduke in military endeavors. They were recognized in the dominion over the crown, and certain privileges were granted to officers from the nobility. Thus, we can rely on better generals. The merchant class ensured our access to cheaper money. They agreed to work for us for less money, and in exchange for certain privileges, they agreed to pay us higher tax revenue. News. Lastly, our emperor also sold some land titles and revoked a few. The clergy also persuaded our emperor at the National Assembly to seek reconciliation with Rome. From the officer school, we managed to obtain an incredible leader, Albrecht von Schönburg. At the Austrian court, we can also boast excellent advisors, Nicolas von Kess and Ulrich von Ettinger. Unfortunately, our ruler did not attract good military advisors, so France supported us in this regard. The court, however, was supposed to support the ruler quite broadly. Spies were sent to Provence to prepare our territorial moves towards the Duchy of Lorraine, the Kingdom of Italy and the Empire. For years, the imperial power over the Kingdom of Italy has been weakening. Successive emperors failed to impose their will on the Italian states, which began to act with total disregard for imperial laws and customs. If we don't address this, it might end badly for us. A war broke out between France and England. England decided not to comply with the provisions of earlier peace treaties and did not return Maine to France. The conflict with France prompted Henry Lancaster to form an alliance with Austria. On August 12th, Austria declared war on Provence, more precisely on the Duchy of Lorraine, with the support of the Papacy. Austrian forces under the command of General Schronberg first struck at Provence's allies, namely Ferrara. Interestingly, the Provencal capital fell much faster than Ferrara's capital. Milan plunged into political chaos. The throne is vacant and the Budding Republic vainly tries to establish order. According to imperial law, the title of Duke should fall to the Emperor himself. While our Emperor is not too interested in this title, he knows it it could be a good reason to humiliate a few Italian duchies and finally show them their place in the empire. So, even though the emperor wanted nothing from Ferrara itself, he still demanded reparations and a monetary donation from them. Thanks to this, the duchy of Ferrara might feel respect towards the emperor. When the war with Ferrara ended, the troops under the command of, what was his name? Von Schumberg struck at the combined armies of Provence and their allies. The battle was bloody, but it ended in a definitive victory for the Austrian forces, which subsequently shattered the forces of Provence. The war with Provence concluded as follows. Aix and Toulon came under the rule of the church. Provence itself paid war reparations. The church didn't get more land because the emperor has certain plans related to it for the future, which he will implement right after dealing with the Italian duchies. Thanks to this, Provence joined the empire because their capital was moved to Verdun, which has long been a province of the Holy Roman Empire. A new duchy for the empire means more support from the other duchies. Out of 
gratitude, Provence itself added its provinces to the empire. In the meantime, Austria, knowing that it must have funds for future wars, decided to expand the gold mine in Intal. Investments were even made in infrastructure here. The emperor also formed an alliance with Provence to use it in the upcoming war against Burgundy. The pretext for the war against the Duchy of Burgundy was claims to French court. A much larger conflict was looming, so Austria called its allies. Friedrich III knew that some electors did not like his current aggressive policy, so he had to use diplomacy and start improving relations with these countries. In this war, the Austrians used a similar tactic, as in the war against Provence. They didn't attack Burgundy first, but their allies, destroying the Genoese forces near Montferrat, literally annihilating them. Unfortunately, while waging wars in the empire, the emperor himself did not enjoy such a significant increase in support. Sadly, near Genoa, the Austrian forces were defeated by the Burgundian coalition. Fortunately, the second battle near Genoa ends in an Austrian victory. After a long siege, the Genoese capital falls and Austria takes war reparations from it. Thanks to this, the Italian duchies become more and more humble. And after these defeats, the Austrian army could finally lay siege to the Burgundian capital itself. In the meantime, Austrian diplomacy worked hard to improve relations with the electors. Unfortunately, the Flemish company was totally defeated. I hope the Spanish army will take revenge. Well, not exactly. It must be admitted that Duke Philip is a really good commander. Following the fall of Western Burgundy, the Austrian army headed towards Dutch forts. Unfortunately, in Castile, the rebellion of the nobility is in full swing, which forced Castile to sign a white peace with France. Therefore, the emperor had no choice but to call another mercenary army. East Frisia joins the empire. In the meantime, news reaches us of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Seriously, What's happening here at all? Naxos, Corfu, what? The war lasted just over four years and was really bloody. As a result of the war, Provence expanded by two provinces. Burgundy paid the empire very large reparations and released the Duchy of Picardy. An added bonus was that the empire expanded to include the Duchy of Burgundy. Duke Philip had no choice, seeing the might of the empire. In 1454, Austria, with the help of Poland, attacked the Kingdom of Bohemia. The aim of the war was to conquer the historic city of Prague, which could become a new center of power in the empire. If the emperor directly controlled a historic place like Prague, it could positively influence his majesty and imperial authority. In the meantime, the Duchy of Picardy joined the empire, probably afraid of the French monster. Our relative on the Hungarian throne suddenly died without an heir. I did nothing here, don't look at me. It's rather tragic, but a great boon for us, because the Hungarian nobility chose Frederick III as the ruler of Hungary. Well, what can I do? Rumors had it that Frederick planned a secret war against Hungary to acquire the mines in Chanta. However, the Hungarian nobility foiled the plan in this regard. The Kingdom of Hungary itself joined the war against the Bohemia, and it won't last long because Prague has just been conquered. The war ended with a total Bohemia defeat. As a result, they lost their capital in Prague, they released Moravia as a separate duchy in the empire, and they lost control over Opol and Gwogo. Of. Prague itself is a very important center for the empire, although heresy has spread here. To get rid of it, we must introduce Austrian administration here. Austrian authorities enjoyed sufficient respect from the papacy. He decided to send for a papal legate. This will help him in diplomatic actions within the empire. Thanks to this, he already gained enough support in the Reichstag to carry out the first reform. A good start, but it's known that each reform progress will be increasingly difficult. After these great victories, Austrian diplomacy focused on improving relations with the remaining Italian Italian duchies. At the same time, Austrian troops attacked Venice to liberate several provinces. Venetian armies were effectively defeated, and the first fortresses fell. The beginning of the campaign looks quite promising. Of course, it couldn't be all good. Rebellions broke out, which we must suppress. We received news that the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order wishes to join the Empire. Our ruler supports their claims, but under certain conditions. The Teutonic Order will not be able to attack any countries of the Holy Roman Empire. Venetian armies were defeated in the Battle of Thessaloniki, and eventually suffered the defeat near Athens. The conflict with Venice ended very quickly after this defeat. It returned territories to Milan, and was forced to release Dalmatia and Aquileia, and attend. Now, how to convert the Bohemian capital? It is very important to do everything in the right order, because it is very difficult. There is a religious center here. First, we need to make a state here again. This will allow us to accept the Bohemian culture. As a result, we don't get a penalty for converting this province. We usually need at least two stability points, as it slightly increases the speed of conversion. Of course, we also need a religious advisor, so I'll be hunting for one now. We also need to reduce the penalty for the province's size. So unfortunately, we have to detach the state again, take away its development, which I needed to accept Czech culture, plus burn it. Then we need to re-establish the state, but this time without double coring. But this province is usually worth it. At this point, we use the conversion edict and also take the edict with missionary strength 
and now we can convert the Czech capital. Of course, if you have an idea on how I could narratively justify all this, I'd be pleased. You can write it in the comments. Thus, the empire expanded to include the Teutonic Order, unfortunately for us, not for long, as Gdansk was released. This will be quite peculiar. And sadly, another incident occurred shortly after. Time to decide on the future of the Italian duchies. Emperor Frederick III decided to use imperial influences, even though he didn't have many, and convinced the Italian duchies to stay in the empire, but for a short time, only 30 years. He had a lot of political leverage to persuade the Italian duchies. He could bribe certain Italian countries. He could also bestow them with imperial grace or opt for a temporary alliance. And thanks to all these political actions, half a year later, the Italian duchies were convinced to stay in the empire and accept imperial rule. Thanks to this diplomatic feat and military genius, all of Christendom realizes the futility of opposing imperial rule, long live the empire, and the emperor is enjoying increasing authority. Under the rule of our leader, the renaissance was also introduced. On a cold December night in 1461, Frederick III von Habsburg decided to abdicate in favor of his son. To strengthen the Austro-Hungarian Union, the electors decided to keep faith with the Habsburg dynasty. Hence, the imperial crown will remain in Austria. Thanks to this move, the Austrian emperor became so powerful that he could secure some electors through the union. But did he really want this to happen? After all, the remaining electors might feel threatened, which would make them less likely to vote for the Austrian emperor. Emperor Ladislaus von Habsburg knew he had to continue his father's policy. For this, he decided to focus on diplomatic actions within the empire. Indeed, he could deal with court matters and strengthen it, but he believed that it wasn't as good as diplomatic actions beyond Austria's borders. Yes, in my opinion, court ideas are currently useless for playing in the empire. And even the bonus here is so marginal that it's not worth the attention. We get two diplomats, diplomatic reputation, cheaper technology, and of course, the ability to break royal marriages without stability penalties, that's much better. To strengthen power, additional church taxes were levied. It was decided to generally use them to build churches throughout Austria. Fortunately, at the beginning of his reign, Emperor Ladislaus was able to further reform the empire, strengthening his diplomatic skills. As Italy again became a bastion of imperial power, the Pope of Rome petitioned to become an imperial prince of the Holy Roman Empire. Emperor Ladislaus certainly wanted to subordinate the papacy. However, after a few years, Ladislaus decided to attack Bohemia and gain control over the country. He didn't expect any significant resistance here. Bohemia entered into a personal union with Austria, renounced their gold mine, and released Lusatia, which became another duchy within the empire. Yes, the emperor definitely controls Bohemia. Among the princes, however, there might be states wanting to challenge us. We cannot let their duchies grow too large. Indeed, some electors did not like the fact that Bohemia came under Austrian rule. Therefore, the elector title from Bohemia was usurped and passed onto Austria. As a result of all these actions, as well as possessing the historic place of Prague, the emperor enjoyed significant support among the princes, and his reputation kept rising. Since Aquilia didn't want to join the empire peacefully, it would join in another way. This became possible thanks to the Third Imperial Reform, which provides a reason for war to annex smaller duchies into the empire. An unexpected event occurred. A combined allied fleet sank the Venetian fleet. Perhaps they aren't such good sailors after all. This opened the way for the imperial army to Venice itself. Due to the recent wars, we managed to finally gather funds to rebuild the city center of Prague after its capture. In the meantime, between reforms, our ruler focused on annexing the smaller Balkan duchies into the empire. In in the meantime, we also managed to seat a ruler from the Habsburg dynasty on the Polish throne, Janefer Kazimierz. He could have been at least better. And when the resources were gathered and the armies prepared, the time came for war with the Emperor of Austria's greatest enemy, the King of France. But unfortunately, we didn't have a good reason to attack. Even so, many of our allies supported us in this war. Initially, Austrian troops moved towards Florence, and after the fall of Florence, sadly, our armies had to strike at Poland as it was attacked by France. Burgundian crisis. This once mighty duchy has become a vassal under our union, and frankly, for now, the emperor decides to keep this union. Meanwhile, the relief of Lublin took place. Austrian troops defended Poland. The French had no more resources for continuing this war. The duchy of Champagne, Bourbonnais, and Dauphiné were released from France. We also received good news from Spain. Given that Queen Isabella as de Trastamara had no heir, she decided that Enrique von Habsburg would become her successor. An agreement was also reached with the Poles. Thanks to this, parts of the Teutonic Order that belonged to the Empire were returned to the Order. The Habsburg dynasty now found itself on the thrones of four mighty states. Some countries perceived the Emperor as weak and did not want to agree to his reforms concerning the centralization of power. He will simply need greater authority. And yes, this is a new modifier that was added, which I completely forgot about, and to not have it. 
Austria itself must have about 2000 development. As you can see, I'm far from it. All imperial borders have also been secured. Everything that was once in the empire returned to the empire. And even the empire itself expanded significantly. The glory of the Habsburgs is growing. In 1509, a reform was carried out that limited the freedoms of imperial possessions so that they could no longer oppose the emperor, which means his authority grows even faster. The power is now so unshakable that we have just overthrown the elective monarchy within the empire. The electors will always vote for us. And I think the last victory in France convinced them of that. But unfortunately, right at our border, a heretical Protestant reformation appeared. Surprisingly, the Pope defended them. However, this reformation will not delay taking full power in the empire, especially when the monument in Prague was fully built. However, the emperor can't tolerate heresy, especially since we also have a Pope after all. So, we invade Zguoguf, and the center of the reformation is in the capital, but in protest that we have taken over power in the Holy Roman Empire, the Pope leaves it, even though we've demonstrated that we are a Catholic Empire through the forced conversion, because we cannot tolerate heresy. And so, in 1523, the Emperor could carry out a reform, which would essentially turn the Holy Roman Empire into one entity. All duchies would have to swear vassalage. This would make all the once independent duchies ordinary feudal vassals of the Emperor. But anyone who refused to swear the oath would for ever leave the empire. It's possible that the emperor will have to use all the authority he has. I've already written that about four dochis oppose it. I don't see any flag here. And I just checked literally each one. Each one supports the reform. I don't know what's going on. I've looked at the electors, free cities and duchies. Now only one is opposed. Provence. Really? According to this, Provence supports it. And after a moment, they do indeed support it. On December 30th, 1525, all duchies pay homage to the Austrian Emperor. And so we lose personal unions. The Czech and Burgundian duchies become our vassals. We have quite a few of them now. The Emperor can now command an army of almost 300,000. He also receives a decent tribute from his vassals, which we can increase. It certainly pays off to change the third reform to one that has a significant impact on vassals. Between us, I'm honestly surprised. Usually, 300 gold was easily extracted, having the entire empire under your thumb. Because literally, these are my lands. And now the emperor has an important decision to make. Whether he wants to rule with the empire composed of small duchies, enjoying some autonomy but being absolutely obedient, or continue to consolidate the empire into one large European empire, which will now have many new opportunities for action, and the ideas of this state are truly formidable. And to you, dear viewer, I recommend this episode, where I show how to unite the Dutch duchies, the mighty Netherlands, then how to develop this country to threaten the major powers of Europe.